All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence to honor our servicemen and women. Thank you. So today is a very amazing night. We have a bunch of students we'd like to recognize. I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Vincent Malafonte. Thank you very much for um, inviting us here to this meeting to acknowledge all of our wonderful musicians from our past festivals uh, back in January and March. Uh, we're going to acknowledge our LISFA students first. Um, this past January, the Long Island String Festival, or LISFA, held their annual festivals, which featured special performing ensembles comprised of our students uh, from Suffolk County. I'd like to recognize the following students who performed their Nismas all last spring, were nominated by their teachers, and then were selected by the committee to participate in this festival. So if you hear your name, please come on up forward. We have a certificate here for you. All right. Aileen Hanley. Mary Singer. Emily Lewis. Come on down. Adelaide Miller. Mason Tomeo. Juliana Martin. McKenna Gallup. Stay up for a picture if you get your award. Stay up. Come back. Joshua Muniz. Avery Kalos. Jacob Topal. Alexandra Lewenhop. Alejandro Suazo Santa Maria. Sofia Slonia. Juliet Stinek. Aaron Palmieri. Matthew Johnson. Jonathan Lee. Um, I'd also like to thank um, their teachers for being here this evening. We have some more string staff here. Mr. Michael Murphy here from Ronkonk Middle School. Thank you for joining us. And Ms. Catherine Hennessy uh, from Bossy, Idle Hour, and Pearl. So thank you. This past March, uh, the Suffolk County Music Educators Association, or SCAMIA, 
held their annual county, all county festival, which featured special performing ensembles comprised of students, again, from all Suffolk County. Um, I'd like to recognize the following students who performed their NISMA solos last year, were nominated by their teachers, and were selected to participate. Um, also, I, I must say that I think this might be the largest amount of students we've had selected th um, this year. We're very proud of all of them, and um, here we go. We're going to start with Division I students. That's our fifth and sixth grade students who participated in this festival. So if you hear your name, come on down and come around to the stage. Hannah Abel. <laughs> Gavin Cohen. Shot, Gavin. Austin Donnelly. Dylan Garrett. David Jallo. Gabriella John Baptiste. Jonathan Casonis. Benjamin Kriegsman. Cassidy Malone. Max Picone Mirasola. Nicholas Santisteban Zolferino. Ethan Sapella. Alexa Shepard. Jalila Shorter. Serafina Bedell. Aminoela Botanaki. Layla Buck, Caitlin Champion, Ashton Cooper, Aaron Hanford, Aiden Hussein, Avery Kalos, Bradley Lamour. Alexa Ray Lamardo. Yes. Sorry, I'm going too fast. I apologize. Hey, Laura Martinez, Catherine Martrano, Adelaide Miller, Sophia Modafferi. Gavin Morrissey, Alice Prikios, Camila Ramos Pereira, Juliana Sevenoaks, Zoe Slyonsky. Tomas Slonina. Kyler Stewart. Mia Tosi. Jillian Warner. Aileen Hanley. Alan Horvath. Emily Lewis, this 
Alexandra Lewinhoff. Joshua Muniz. Alejandro Suazo Santa Maria. Mackenzie Sullivan. Mason Tomeo. Jacob Topal. And Ira Yu. So th these are our fifth and sixth grade students who participate in Division I Central Festival. Let's give them a big round of applause. We line up. This is a great sized group. And our Division I teachers, if you're here, come on down and join us. If you want to join us for a photo, too, we have Miss Guiney, um, who teaches band. Yes, Miss Guiney. Woo! Ms. Sycamore Eilauer, Ms. Hennessy, Mr. DeSanto, and Mr. Murphy. have our Division II students, which is our seventh and eighth grade students. Uh, so if you hear your name, please call them on up and collect your certificate and pose for a photo. All right. Our Division II, uh, Magdalene Anthony Raj. <laughs> Ashley Basso. Addison Brasselier, Morgan Silabrasi, Ashley uh, um, Kanzler, Kira Laraca, Ariana Moran, Sean O'Connor. Ella Cardone, Abigail Landris, Kyla Getty, Michael Johnson, Aiden Young, and Troy Nugent. Alisa Wilson, Devin Connell, Sabrina De Capua, Noah Huff, Ryan Mulvey. Erin Palmieri, Richard Shetty, Zofia Slonina, and Ava Yazbek.
Okay, and our last group here we'd like to acknowledge is our Division Three participants, which is our ninth and 10th grade students. So if you hear your name, come on up. William Carey. Brady Dunn. Paul Hine. Riley LaRocca. Christopher Martin. Xavier Vargas. John Thomas Aloperdi. Austin Baker. Samantha DeLuca. Tessa Dollinger. Olivia Ferrentino. Casey Miller. Timothy Moulton. Julia Nischke. Haley Premier. Nadia Roddy. Christopher Rappelt. Elizabeth Smith. Sincere Stallworth. Abigail Thomas. Andrew Walksmith. Bryn Burke. Matthew Johnson. Flynn Lavery. And Jonathan Lee. Where'd you go? Eva Yazbek. There you are. We found your certificate. Um, thank you again. We're very proud of our students who have been invited to participate for these prestigious ensembles. Uh, they represented Connecticut very well uh, at their performances and their rehearsals. Thank you, as always, for your support uh, for the Board of Ed and the community to allow us to do these things. Um, additionally, I'd like to take a moment to publicly announce the creation of the Connecticut Art and Music Hall of Fame. Um, the hall will recognize and celebrate alumni and community members who have achieved extraordinary success in the arts, or have provided exemplary service to schools, community, or the families of Connectwide. This was started back in 2017 with our former director, John Michael Lasher, setting up initial committee. Unfortunately, at the time, we only had one meeting, uh, but the vision and the idea was created, and this past summer, we brought the committee back and we were able to move forward with the creation of this hall. So we are having our inaugural induction ceremony on Saturday, May 11th at 11 a.m at the Connecticut High School in the Eric Martinson Performing Arts Center. The hall will be featured outside the auditorium in the lobby area. We're very excited to be inducting 10 new members into the hall soon. And updates, as always, can be found on the Fine Arts and Music District webpage. So once again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to acknowledge all of our talented students on behalf of all the music teachers, and thank you for joining us this evening to support your students. I'd like to share congratulations to all of our students. We're very proud of them. And we look forward to seeing all of our students continue to impress us with their talents in May at all of our upcoming spring concerts. So thank you again, and thank you all for being here this evening. Mr. Mr. Malafronte, first of all, let me congratulate all our outstanding and talented students, our teachers, and our supportive family. Thank you all so very much. But Mr. Malafronte, I believe Connect Club was just recognized 
um, it, with something very special, and I was going to talk about it in my update, but I think it should come from the music man himself. So why don't you please update the community on ConnectWatch recognition. So yes, yeah, so if um, you were, did not see the announcement on the district webpage, we were, again, announced as um, one of the best communities for music education. So congratulations to all of us. It's, it's really a wonderful thing. Um, a, a lot of factors go into that, and I believe it's about 7% of the entire nation that gets this achievement, so we're one of that small you know, percentage that get that, so we're very fortunate, and it's because of our wonderful students, our teachers make an impact, our administration, our board of ed support, and of course, all the parents and community. Thank you for letting us do all this, and I guarantee it's making a tremendous impact in the lives of your children and their growth and development, so continue to uh, support them and push them, and we will... Uh, continue to do great things with them. So thank you, and thank you for that acknowledgement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and congratulations to all of you. I was actually so excited to introduce all of you that I forgot to ask the district clerk to call the roll. So if I could ask the district clerk right now to call the roll, I'm sorry. Mr. Kolehipar? Yes, hello. Mr. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Mallon? Present. Dr. Sennemore? Present. Mrs. Napolitano Ferno? Present. Mrs. DiLorenzo? Present. Mrs. Iannatelli? Present. And Mr. Pisano? Present. So I apologize for that, but congratulations to all of our students. Another round of applause for all of you. I will now hand over the floor to Mr. Hauser for our budget presentation. So Ms. Mallon, I'm actually going to jump in briefly to kind of uh, that lead off in this budget presentation. All right. Um, so before I pass the baton to our business Hauser. official, I'm going to give, yeah. Something I said no. about the budget. <laughs> We should really let the student government also talk before we all talk, so that if they, you know, so that they don't have to sit through a budget if they, if she has to get home to school. So, so I have I been moved in the batting order? <laughs> kids first, kids first. Student government, if you would like to come. Do you not want to hear our budget? Is that what it is? <laughs> Hello? So, student government will be starting to sell parking spots for incoming seniors for the 24 25 class this April. The paint over date is May 28 for the current drivers in the parking lot. This has been an issue, so going forward, numbers will be permanently marked on the spots, and students going forward, it is their responsibility to do a base coat before they paint, to use less paint, and for it to be easier to remove and not cause an issue. Requiring a base paint will have no damage on the spots and the blacktop. Student government is coming up to an election, and the week that is that is planned is Thursday, April 25th. Student government petitions will be handed out. The campaign day is May 20th. The elections are May 21st, and the results are May 22nd. A run is being sponsored by students at Connect High School. The event is a 5K run slash walk for mental health awareness, and it will take place Sunday, May 19th at 9 a.m., which is a Sunday at the high school. They are also excited to offer a kid's dash for little ones. And together, they will host with Center Mariches, North Babylon High School, and leaders who are also a part of the, th the three-part 5K walk series will be able to walk free of charge. All students will be, all will be able to participate um, free of charge, regardless of whether you're helping out. And it's just important to come out and spread awareness and talk about a good cause. Um, so going forward, um, tickets are being sold for junior prom and sophomore trip. So tickets for sophomore trip are being sold next week in attendance. Tickets for junior prom, which is important, are only being sold May 1st to the 3rd. 
and the event takes place Wednesday, June 12th, 6 to 10 p.m. at Flower Fields, and the theme is A Night in Hollywood, and it's $145. Sorry, it was a long one. Thank you. Not long ago, not long at all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Senator I will pass the floor back to you. Thank you, thank you. And again, congratulations to all of our students and a great uh, student government update as well. So before we start the formal budget presentation, um, I just wanted to provide a little bit of uh, commentary. So here we are, we're one week before the district's budget adoption, and the state is still in a holding pattern with their own adoption. The Connecticut at stake is approximately $1 million and would, would equate to a moderate 3% aid increase. We know both houses in the legislature, through a bipartisan effort, have advocated for schools to receive their fair state aid increases. We certainly appreciate the efforts of our own locally elected Albany officials in both the Senate and the Assembly. Because the governor is still refusing to allocate the aid increase, we have to have a plan B uh, if we don't receive it. And that plan B has a direct impact on our staffing, and that will be presented tonight. And the potential of this plan B, the potential of what is known as excessing, is something that we take very, very seriously. The good news is that it is not too late, and our advocacy matters. Our voices can still be heard. Our board, myself, our administration, our teachers, our support staff, PTA, SEPTA, um, the boosters for the arts and athletics and civics have all been advocating, and we have to keep that pressure on the governor so that the, you know, she knows that she needs to provide this aid increase to not just Connecticut, but all the school districts across New York State, certainly our neighbors here on Long Island, and do so by early next week. I've been working with the Board of Education on reducing the budget burden on our taxpayers while also maintaining programs and desired class sizes through a plan of attrition. You'll see tonight how we have furthered this plan. However, without adequate state aid increases, attrition alone won't suffice. Now, our budget adoption is due to be next Tuesday, the 16th. But right now, as I said at the beginning, we don't have an adopted state budget. So there is the potential, um, and we'll know, you know by the beginning of next week, obviously, that we may need to, by a day or two, we may need to adjust our own budget adoption because of the state's budget adoption. Uh, situation. So I ask everyone to please continue their outreach to the governor's office. office. Thank you. At this time, I will pass this budget presentation baton over to our business official, Mr. House. Thank you, Dr. Sonoma. So tonight, uh, we're going to be uh, looking at the proposed uh, expenditures and revenues uh, for the 2024-25 school year. Uh, this will be the third draft of the third and uh, the revenue budget uh, in public. Um, if, if, and one thing, let me just make a note. There were 20 copies uh, of the budget. I believe they were handed out to security. Um, I have three copies here. If anybody uh, cannot see this and you'd like to uh, get hand this uh, to you. So up here right now is a copy of the, the calendar. Uh, we started all the way back up in January, and I highlighted uh, April 9th. Uh, as Dr. Senamore said, uh, we're about a week away from uh, what, what is the proposed date to adopt uh, the school budget, which uh, we may have to be flexible uh, by a few days there. Uh, and then looking a little further into the future, uh, May 14th, so a little bit uh, more than a month from now is the public uh, budget hearing. And then on May 21st is the actual budget vote along with the school board election. Uh, this whole presentation will be up on the district's website tomorrow uh, for anyone to view. Oops, sorry. Okay, uh, this might be a little difficult to see. There's a lot of numbers and, and Columns here, but for the most part, uh, I'll start from the top and I'll work my way down. Uh, start up with, starting up at the top in yellow, we have the proposed uh, expenditure budget. So that's how much we expect to spend um, starting in the 24-25 school year. Uh, we got that number down to about 3.95 percent. Okay, the last time we presented uh, that was over four percent. 
Moving uh, further down is a spot uh, that's highlighted in green. Uh, that's the 3% state aid hold harmless or save uh, harmless that Dr. Senamore uh, was speaking about. And that's the amount of money that we hope uh, the state legislature and the governor will come through with uh, any day now. And then down a little further uh, in yellow is the amount to be raised uh, by taxes from the uh, the Connecticut School District community. So that number right now stands at about a 3.29% increase uh, from the current school year. And just a little further down, I've mentioned this in the past, uh, at the very bottom, there's the, the last five lines uh, highlight uh, different scenarios based on uh, individual assessed uh, value uh, homes or residences uh, in the community. So starting at $10,000 uh, assessed uh, valuation home, uh, we anticipate that the school taxes would be about a uh, $66.29 increase from uh, the current year. And then we moved it down uh, in increments of 10 to give everyone an idea of how much uh, it might uh, cost for your own individual home. The assessed values uh, vary depending upon exemptions uh, on different homes, so we would encourage you to actually take a look at your real estate tax bill to see what your assessed value is. Okay, uh, moving along here, uh, what we try to do here is we have to um, abide by the New York State tax cap formula. So up at the New York State Comptroller's Office, there's a formula to calculate every uh, school district's uh, respective tax cap. And for our district, uh, the maximum, what we would call the eligible uh, tax cap, is 3.35%. Okay, the middle line there, which is highlighted in more of a yellow, is the recommended tax cap. So we are coming in, uh, as we speak right now, at 3.29%. And the difference of those two lines, which is in green, would be a savings to the community of $76,000. Okay, here, um, I'm going to turn this over. Perhaps, uh, Reza, would you like to speak on the savings through attrition? I would love to. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, part of the uh, budget requires us to make some concessions and some serious considerations to personnel. As Dr. How as Mr. Hauser and Dr. Senamore have said repeatedly, the budget is primarily made up of uh, personnel and personnel costs. So uh, as to affect the fewest amount of people, we try to do things through attrition. So when somebody either retires or resigns or the position hasn't been filled, we go ahead and decide that we will not meet that position for the following school year. So in that, you can see by this chart, the savings through attrition, we have an administrative position. Uh, we have several teaching positions. Again, either these teachers have retired or resigned. Uh, there is one operations uh, position there, and there is a half a clerical position. So all told, there will be 12 and a half positions or FTEs, full-time equivalents, that will not be hired for the 24-25 school year. So I, I do think, Mr. Hauser, we have to skip one page. Yes, please. That's too much. Actually, you know what? Before we do that slide, go back to the other slide. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. One more? No, no that, yeah. So, nope. One Next more. one. One more. So, yeah, Mr. Hauser. Questions from if, if, you, if you like. We only have a couple slides. Okay, so I'll save you some. Okay. So let me just make a comment on, on this slide. Um, you'll notice that um, through the additional attrition, um, this slide has been adjusted from the previous one. In, in the slide, a couple slides ago, that had all the numbers on it, there is an allocation of various reserves and fund balances. Um, as we look to bridge this gap, which is a combination of state aid and additional funding, um, the state aid makes up the, the bulk of it. Um, and I, as I referenced earlier, 
um, but we would be also recommending above and beyond the uh, use of fund balance and reserves um, an additional $317,000 in change. Um, but that will also segue into the very next slide that I referenced. And Mr. Uh, Koalifa, I'm going to let you speak to that one. Uh, okay, I uh, I apologize. I know that we changed, uh, but <clears throat> should the state aid that we keep talking about that three percent or one million, roughly one million dollars, does not come to fruition as we suspect it may, uh, there will have to be some hard decisions made, and uh, some additional uh, positions may have to be cut from the budget, which will lead to excessing of positions. And those positions, uh, as a combination, are in the neighborhood of uh, 9.0 FTEs. Uh, we are considering administrative positions and additional teaching positions. Um, you know, and one thing I m must note is that we have been talking about the new dance program that we would like to support. If there is sufficient student interest in the dance program, we are going to run the stance program, but it will not be at the expense of our current staff. We will house that. We will uh, teach that with through the physical education department. So some of our phys ed teachers may be taking on these uh, dance classes. Uh, but as I said, this is uh, the state aid outlook. Should the district not receive the three percent, uh, we're very hopeful that we will. And uh, through Senator White's efforts and Dr. Senamore's efforts, I do believe we will eventually get what we are owed. It's, I just, just because it's not going to bother me. So, uh, first and foremost, I said this in executive, so I'm going to say it in public. Um, I was unaware that you guys were going to be looking at not replacing in operations. I know we spoke about teaching and in, 20, in March of 2020, there were 30 positions that were put on the chopping block. And I specifically with other Board of Ed members advocated for those, for those positions. And I'm glad we did because days later, COVID struck and we were closed down. And we needed positions and we needed more people when we opened up again for smaller classes. But here we are now after COVID and we have to, we're not getting the aid from COVID. I appreciate that you guys were able to go under the tax cap, the eligible tax cap. It's something that I've been saying for a few years now that I really hate that we go to the tip of the nose for our, our community's sake and the taxpayer's sake. It's unfair to keep going and pushing that number higher and higher and higher. But at the same token, I also, and looking at some of these positions that are going through attrition. Three, special education teachers. Special education has gotten hit so hard during COVID. I was told specifically by the department and also when I sat with Mrs. Poppy and Mrs. O'Hara last year, um, or maybe it was the year before, Mrs. Poppy, I remember, it was, last, was it last year or the year before? It may have been both. Yeah, I think I sat with you guys each. Each year I like to sit with, um, to go over special ed because I do have a soft spot. I understand that people don't see the struggles and the challenges that some of our students face. And it really is there and it needs to be in the forefront. And I just don't understand how we're gonna have three teachers that we're not going to, we're not gonna replace. So are we not replacing a, the special education teacher position? Or is it that those would be the lowest people? Uh, like, I understand this is through attrition, so this is through retirement. So uh, I'm gonna, it's not the same as the excessive. It's a great question. Great question. I'm going to start it and then pass the baton uh, to Ms. Poppy. So the special ed positions are basically driven through um, the CSC uh, process uh, in terms of, um, you know, the classification of students and what their special education programmatic needs are going to be for the subsequent school year. So that is absolutely driven by those needs. And so I just want to clarify that when we have retirements uh, and or resignations for whatever reason, 
the opportunity to take advantage of attrition is based on, you know, are, are we still meeting the needs of programmatic needs when we're talking special education students, we're talking whatever their least restrictive environment uh, need is based on the CSC process, based on uh, the IEP. Um, so this is in consultation with the special education department, but I'm going to let Ms. Poppy kind of take that baton and go with it. Dr. Sia, I would echo everything that you just said. So this was developed in consultation with the special education department, specifically Mrs. O'Hara, in terms of what next year's projected needs will be and what our CSE process is telling us, right? So we are much further into that process now than we were certainly last month and the month prior, and we have a, a stronger handle on where those particular positions will either represent a need or we can sunset in other areas because the student need is not there. So there's a data backing to this conversation that is relative, current, and is not a, a kind of a cut that is made without deliberation and will the ratio for special education students in a classroom Will the ratio go up student to teacher? Because I really, like I said, after COVID, we saw all students having challenges, not every single one, but we saw a lot of challenges in general ed, whether it was general ed or special ed. But we also saw a year later, when, when I sat down with you guys, that special ed had taken a very big hit from virtual because a lot of students had a hard time focusing or, or doing the virtual platform, and especially the special ed that needed that extra help. So I just want to make sure that the ratio student to teacher in the special education department is not going to rise. Mm -hmm. That is something that right now I will advocate strongly for not rising, because regardless, what we have to make sure that our students are successful first and foremost. And in order to do that, we have to support our teachers in the classroom with students, especially students who have some challenges. Absolutely, I understand the concern and I'm glad you articulated it. We are required to maintain a level of compliance in all of our special education settings and we will continue to do so. Regardless of the number that you're seeing in this presentation, we will continue with, with those particular, meeting those particular requirements and meeting the needs of our children. Thank you. And the other one was, like I said, when we spoke in executive, I did when I first saw this, um, and I just was questioning um, a position. I didn't realize that it was going to be the operations unit where we are losing someone from maintenance through uh, attrition. But we're not going to replace. And we have so many things going on right now in with the bonds and with all the other. I would just like the community to understand uh, this is something that I would not be advocating for, and I, and I know you guys are saying it's only for a year, but if you're saying we only have to do this for a year, then obviously it's still necessary. So another great question, and I'm going to ask um, John Allen, our assistant to the superintendent who oversees facilities and operations, if you could speak, Mr. Allen, as to why, at least for one year, um, why the district could not fill this vacated um, operations position, you want to provide some uh, insight. Thank you. Sure. So as we were discussing in exec, um, it is definitely a challenging position. And lunch room, I see that with, you know, I've said it with the bus drivers. I understand we have some issues getting people, you know, getting more people in. But with this specific position, that's not the case. We're just holding off. And I understand we have, we have an issue here, and let's hope the money comes through. If it doesn't, tough decisions are going to have to be made. This would not be one of the ones that I would be for. I just need to let that be known. I can greatly appreciate that. Thank you. I have, I have to I have to agree with Jackie, especially if we're doing all the HVAC work in the buildings. Would we not? Just my mind, would we not need that position eventually? I appreciate before the end of the year. I appreciate you um, saying that, Marisol, because an executive, you certainly didn't say a word about supporting it. And I appreciate that in public, you, you, you finally agree with me. Thank you. I, I, I have no problem agreeing with you when I agree with you. Well, I just feel like 
if you're agreeing, then you should have said that in executive when I was fighting for it. Well, I'm saying it now in public where it should be said. Well, Mr. It, should have been said, it should be said because you genuinely support it, not because you're looking for people to, you know, think that you support something that I don't think you do. She's not campaigning. Thank you. No, it's okay. Brian, thank you. Brian, I thank don't you. think she thank needs you. to. Thank I don't you. think she needs Mr. a Allen, lawyer. Please. I don't think she needs you as an attorney. So your point is taken, and it's not something that, that came into a conversation lightly by any stretch. Um, with all the equipment that is going in, the only saving grace I could say with any of it is when you do new equipment, you usually get, we get a two-year warranty. That is a small consolation because of the amount of equipment existing that we already have in the district. Um, so that's the reason why there was a, a consideration for a year's delay in this position. Thank you. I have a question about the gas. So um, I had spoke to administration last week about this. I had the opportunity to go visit one of our educational programs that I think we're going to speak about later. Um, and I immediately um, let them know that I cannot support having a new program brought in if we're going to actually access some of the educational programs that we have already existing in place. Um, with that, I am just curious, when you look at the budget under the dance in high school, there is a cost of 24998. Can you tell me what that cost is for? So if I'm understanding you correctly, the, the line item you're referring to, does it specifically say uh, dance? Uh, yes, it says dance high school. Um, and then if you go across, it says 24998. So if it was going to be under the physical education, I didn't think we'd um, increase that budget. So that's that's based on the scenario that we get the aid that we need and and there's student interest. Because if, if the student enrollment doesn't warrant, then, then we're not going to have two classes or even one class. In this scenario, that we don't get the state aid, I'm in full agreement full agreement that we don't hire a part-time dance certified teacher. Um, if by some chance there was enough student interest to run a class or two um, and we don't get the aid, we could still run it, but it would be through physical education. Okay, so let me add two more questions. I just want to say something for that. I want to say something for this too. Yeah. I agreed with you when we yes. were at the interventionist, yes. when we were visiting the interventionist, that's, we were both in agreement on that that the dance program is something we wouldn't bring in a new program that's an elective if we have to access. Right, so let me ask you this. Um, would the dance class be considered a gym credit? This is one of my two questions. Because if it's under phys ed, right. Yeah, if it's under phys ed, are they gonna get credit? Because, you know. Ms. Poppy has this one, right? Sure, so this is listed as uh, credit bearing in the arts, not phys ed. Okay, so it goes instead of an art class, you can take a dance class? In the arts, right. Not a phys ed class. And so that's and how it's why sitting. is it under phys ed? Well, that, that's how it's... The teacher, it doesn't matter if it's... If, if, if we teacher, don't get an aid, we would have a physical education teacher come in and teach the class if there's interest and we don't get the aid. I was saying budget-wise, if we're putting it under phys ed. I see. I think I it's... it's You don't have it's to answer the, that no, now, it's Bob, a part -time, that, that it's does... A, it's a part-time it's it's part dance certified teacher if we have the, the perfect scenario of full state aid and student interest. But if we don't have the state aid, we're not going to, regardless of student interest, hire an additional staff. We would see if we had the student interest and then look to uh, provide the class through phys ed. My other thing is, um, back to the interventionists, who, um, again, I went and saw that program and, and truly support. I want to say that this, you said this is if the budget passes. But last week, um, Christina presented that and said we were going to cut the interventionists in half. So it would go from the eight or nine to the four. So um, if that's the case, I still don't want to add. No, they, said, it, they did it last week and that the public. We so since we spoke about that last week and Christina already announced it, <laughs> I would like to understand 
why we put money towards the new program is what I'm trying to say instead of trying to keep what we already have. So, Ms. Poppy, I think I understand the question in terms of, and if you don't mind, because I love, I love your vernacular, uh, in terms of your term reimagining, through the COVID relief funds, uh, the district was able to implement uh, an elementary interventionist program that was staffed with nine positions. And we felt that there were a minimal of four positions. And, and the piece about the, the state aid at the last presentation was to say, you know, we, we feel we could do this with four, but it's, this is still contingent upon the state aid. Now, that four could possibly be five. Uh, Ms. Poppy, can you speak to the four or five and, and how it could still be um, a, a very effective program, even if it doesn't, if, even if it is not staffed with nine teachers? Sure. So this is hearkening back to the discussion that we had during the last Board of Education meeting, right? And that conversation was dependent upon the district's receipt of state aid. With that state aid, imagining that program differently becomes a necessity because we would be looking at a reduction from the nine individuals who are currently doing the work in our elementary buildings to a lower or a lesser number. The positions themselves would change in that they would become district-wide service providers, right? As opposed to individuals servicing specific school buildings and dealing with student populations in only singleton school buildings. I'm a firm believer that in order for any program to work, especially here in Connecticut, and I think many members of the board would agree with me, that we have to give the opportunity for the people who are doing the work to talk about how effective that can be given the parameters that we issue administratively and to help them sort of dream the program into existence with plenty of support and backing every step of the way. So in terms of what exactly that would look like, the best I'm able to say at this point is that it would be a shared service among, school, among schools as opposed to an individual provider offering support to just a singleton building. Beyond that, the particulars would be thought about specifically, thoughtfully, would be planned, would be reinforced at, at the, the level of, of the people who are doing the work along with some administrative guidance and oversight. Thank, thank you. I just want to explain to the public just because um, my, myself, I didn't truly understand the position. So I just want the public to understand that this position is, uh, there is one in each school right now, two I believe in Cherokee, and they are the first people to learn any new program, anything we're rolling out. They actually, because they are at the school, go and roll this out to the teachers in the classroom. They are the ones providing um, the instruction. And since they're in the building, they can support with anything that is needed on any new program. On top of that, they actually push into every classroom that is in need uh, when a student they see the initial you know, might need a little bit of help on something. And they push into the classroom and spend six weeks with each child, uh, giving them um, instruction on how to, uh, you know, um, each one of their skills, because I'm not gonna, I'm not a teacher, so I'm yeah, not gonna speak on that. It was fun. There was a whole bunch of them, there was, yeah. And um, that, uh, I can honestly say that I got to, um, you know, um, witness a student who was in her last session and I actually had to get up and ask the director, what was the deficit? Because this girl, the student, had no deficit. And they told me it was her last one. And I was so impressed that, you know, they showed me, um, you know, what, what was the reason it started and where she was. And the results were incredible. And to start that at such an early age and have early intervention and, and be able to have that one-on-one, -on -one, again, pushing into the classrooms, I really, I, I can't say enough on how important it is to have that early intervention. 
And I think it will help so many kids later on who we know and see have problems with reading, math, and other, and other things. So I do feel that it's a very important position for our district to keep. So when we went to, we went, myself and April went to idle hour for this, this role to, and one of the teachers was nice enough to make us a cheat sheet, thank you very much. And uh, what is the role of an interventionist? Utilize universal screeners to identify deficits in learning, set ambitious goals, provide interventions and support to close academic gaps, Clo closely monitor progress, collect and assess data, reevaluate goals and adjust plans accordingly, establish support plans for classroom teachers, school-wide implementation of new programs. And the other form was school-wide support, consultation and impl implementation. And I gotta tell you, it was excellent what we watched. Um, these are seasoned teachers, they know their stuff, they're very good with the kids, we watch them. They get, really, and also what, what you didn't get to say is, they're supporting the teacher in the classroom, which most people don't really realize. It's not just supporting the child in need and the children in need, that they're doing it right at the same time that class is taking place. So it's like, it's very quick so that the kids don't, they have a better focus, a focal point of doing it and then going back to their regular work. And they keep doing that consistently. And it really makes a difference. I know this for myself from before I was a board member. I have a child that had, had similar issues and it really has made all the difference, especially with when people don't realize Reading comprehension is such a huge thing in life. As an adult, I have struggled with this, and I know many people that struggle with this. It is something that if you have this kind of help at such a young age, it will make you more successful in all of your educational classes because reading comprehension is something you need to be successful in every class academically. You need to be able to read things and understand what you read, and a lot of times it's the phonics. Like here she has a Branching Minds program was piloted and provided support to the faculty. So it's, it's actually helping of the teachers in the classroom pushing it. And a lot of these teachers, you have 24, 25 kids, 23 kids. You can't always, always work one-on-one -on -one with that student who might need the phonics or might need some of these other things. Like they provided alphabet cards for letter sounds, practice and additional support. They provided additional practice activities for two weeks with grades four and five. They did a, a um, provided Google Slides, created a teacher drive of resources for teaching all year. I mean, these are things that a lot of people don't realize. You know, consistent collaboration and consultation with teachers to address teacher concerns and provide support materials and suggestions. Excellent program. I would not be for cutting this. So I had the opportunity to go see the program in action at Sycamore, and I have to agree with April and Jackie. I had I got the opportunity to see two of the students also um, showcase their how much they've learned throughout the program, and they apply the superhero concepts that's taught to them with the letters. And I saw the little boy like um, phonetically sound out the word in his head while before he said it out loud. I can't tell you how impressed I was. I myself had my, my son needed to pull out also for uh, reading. It affected his math, like Jackie says. It starts to affect other areas. If this program was around when my child was in elementary school, what a world of a difference this would have done. It's 10 minutes pull out instead of the 20, 30 minutes that they used to do back in the day. And those 10 minutes are so intense and so beneficial to the child. It's an amazing program. I, I would definitely be not for getting rid of any of it. I think it's important just to, to ensure that we're making note that this program was implemented with the support of our COVID release, relief monies, right? So as a district, yeah. we made a decision to invest those monies in this, this sort of model of Yes, teacher coaching, which is what it was thought it could be initially, but our teachers said we need help now. We need help, hands-on help in our classrooms, filling the gaps that COVID kind of created in student learning. 
And so the position became a hybrid. It's a true testament to the work of the teachers and the, the administrator who is overseeing this program in how quickly and how swiftly that support has been delivered to students, how thoughtfully the support has been delivered to students and to teachers in our schools. This COVID money, however, I think universally the board knows, is sunsetting on September 30th of 2024. Right, so the monies that we're using now to support the salaries and benefits for these positions is, is being removed. And that's why this is a larger discussion impacting our, our general fund, our operating budget for next year. I just wanted to give a bit of the wherefore and why. Yeah. Something that we talked about on those visits was about you know, this, this level of support either being needed because of COVID, or Learning. are these types of needs always there within children, right? And I think all of the presenters did a great job in saying that these are deficits that we see, these are gaps that we see in all children, regardless of whether or not they've been affected by the pandemic. So that really does speak to the need and the power. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we're just in a place where we're considering what we've experienced with nine interventionists, two in Cherokee, two in Sycamore, one in every other elementary school, and, and working through what that could look like with uh, fewer people in a similar role. You know, this yeah. is what we had said when we went in idle hour. Me, I had spoken to you, Mrs. Poppy, and I had said that we, we put this, I was with you during this, during COVID, when the board decided that there was learning loss and the money had come in and this was gonna be the way that you guys had come up with to, to, to bridge that gap. And when we were sitting there with the interventionist and the director, and I had told the story about my own child and that was pre-COVID, that was pre me being on a board. And we said, that's the issue that I don't think people realize. These gaps were always there. These gaps where students need the extra support at the young age. Elementary school is paramount, and it really does make a difference for your success going forward. A uh, child who, you know, doesn't have good reading, good phonics, any of those kind of issues can't speak. You know, a lot of people see that, that some people, you hear talk to kids in middle school and high school, and you still can't understand what's being said. These are things that even though you have speech teachers, even though we have the math teachers, even though we have the reading pull out, this is such a nice program. I understand if we have a state aid issue, there are gonna be some very tough decisions to be made, very tough. Um, but I also understand that programs like this, I wish we could just, you know, educational programs should be the last programs that we are looking to, to try to excess or make smaller. These are the programs we should hold on to. I see a lot of the elected electives, which I am for, but I have always said education first. Education, education, education. And this kind of situation, even though it came, it came into play because of COVID, because we got the money, this is something that I know other board members who were here for a long time, they had fought for because there were so many issues with our middle schoolers having reading comp issues. We saw that on the test. We saw that that was their problem. We, I feel like taking out something like this or trying to reimagine it smaller is not really being fair to our schools. You know, that's the issue, too, with, again, doing more with less. But I want to piggyback on that and just say that um, I understand that we get COVID relief money, but I totally agree with the fact that, you know, I am for electives also, but education comes first. And I, I really feel we're not looking at this budget correctly. You know, we have a lot of clubs, electives. Like we, we need to look at the monies and, and know, is this the program we want to cut? Even though it came about with extra money, it's something that maybe should have come about way before that. And, and now that we know it's working and now that we have it, I, I really think we need to look at a way to keep it. And I, I want that on record because I don't want this to, you know, we come, sometimes, you know, we come out of these meetings and we say all the things we say, but nothing happens after and I don't want this to happen with this program. I don't want us to all say this and then, ah, it just wasn't in the budget. I really want us to look and like, you know, um, it was said, like the electives, the clubs, 
everything. We know what money is being used and where is it being used. So we absolutely hear you loud and clear. I have had the opportunity to visit the program. It's an outstanding program. It is a data-driven program in terms of the results. Um, so yes, to everyone's point, even with the full allotment of state aid to maintain a program of nine staff, there would probably still have to be some difficult decisions uh, regarding staffing uh, elsewhere. But we understand, and that's why we have a, a uh, budget development process with the board in public for public input. We certainly have gotten the input from our teaching staff. Um, it's an outstanding program. We hear you, and we will continue to look at it. Mr. Hauser, any questions? <laughs> so if I may, uh, I just want to bring up one thing uh, regarding the calendar. Um, it's not really budget related, so to speak, but um, Dr. Sinemore had asked me to mention uh, the possibility and the discussion that we've been having about bringing back uh, printed calendars for uh, the community, uh, parents, uh, so, um, we, uh, just so everyone is aware, we have been having these discussions to consider, um, the, you know, how many pages, the type of, uh, of um, the number of calendars that would be distributed to the community, and, uh, and it's an ongoing conversation right now. Does anybody in the audience have a budget question? I do. Oh, Jack, yes. Um, oh, which I want to I want to thank everybody who helped to answer. Um, I sent about uh, almost thirty questions, and thank you, Mr. Hauser, for pulling answers from all different areas to answer these questions. I appreciate all the work everybody put into it. M many of those questions were just a part of my learning experience, so I appreciate everything that everybody input. So I, I do have some follow up questions based on the answers that I received. If I, you know, if we can go back to some of these and. One of them was, a lot of these actually are some of them where you actually said it's possible to cut and trim those lines. So I'd like to go back to them. One of them was about the public relations proceeds, and it was in regards to the, which one was it? Let's see. oh, syntax's fee of website hosting. And we were not sure yet if we were going to have that. Are we doing that? Is that, and it's, that's not a, well, it's, eight, it's over $8,000. But is that something that we are going to be doing? Is that an area where we can trim? Um, so I don't have an answer right now as far as if syntax will be. We will, no matter what, need website hosting. Um, so no matter what, that we, we would need money for that. Okay. Um, whether it's syntax, whether it would stay in that line or move somewhere else, um, would be um, once we get further direction um, and clarification from them, it, it, that could potentially change. But again, we would need those funds, uh, no matter what. No matter what. Okay, so it's not necessarily that just from syntax. I mean, it's just, that was what the answer was, but it's not necessarily that. Okay, okay, I understand it. Um, another question that I have is for another line, which was plants and facilities substitute locum, where we said it's possible that we can cut that down, possibly, because the expenditures have leveled off. Is that is that a possibility where we could save a little bit there? If I have the line of what the code. Does that make it easier? If you don't mind, yep. Sure. Okay. It is one six two zero one six six one two zero 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 zero. Jack, if I heard you correctly, one six two zero one six six one two. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, so this happens to be uh, a plant and facilities substitutes code? Yeah. If I'm looking at it correctly? Yep, and, and in particular, it's slocum. Only because when I asked a few questions about this, it's possible that it could be brought down a little bit since the expenditures have worked for. So I'm just wondering, is that a possibility? So. I would say so, and you know, if I understand correctly, substitutes and, and particular custodians throughout the district, that they may be, um, I'll say, coded the way their payroll is set up. They may be assigned to one particular school, Slocum in this case, but if they're needed as a substitute in, in another school building, 
we may not be changing that code each time they go to cover. So it, it may be, I'll say, artificially inflating the amount that's actually spent at that particular school when, when they may be at other schools throughout the school. Okay, so that they can float between. Could be, yeah, that's okay. what I think is a possibility. Yep. Okay. But yeah, I would say, you know, that's why we okay. keep an eye on these codes because as you asked and we, we provided the answer to you, we may be able to, to reduce that. Okay, okay. Now that I have some of those answers, I can eliminate some of my other questions. Okay, that was another one for that. Oh, one is actually more of a, a comment than anything. Um, the question that I asked about ground supplies, about the outside vendor, and I know the answer was that the what we wound up doing is where the, the, re the way the budget worked was so that we could now purchase our own materials to do that, which in the end will save us. Is that correct? Is that how it, am I reading that correct? That for ground supplies, that it's going to actually give us a savings eventually, uh, uh, you know, over time, because now we're going to be doing the work ourselves. John, you want to? Yeah, I, I think everybody okay. can hear me. So, if this is for the people at home. Just turn around, I'm sorry. You still can hear me? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. You can hear it? I can hear it. Okay. So there's a few things that the, that the department has taken on over the years. Um, one of the expenses that we've been realizing on the ground side of it is irrigation is extremely expensive. Uh, last year we spent approximately $40,000, $45,000 to do all the irrigation repairs to fix the heads and everything else. So what we're hoping to do, what we're going to try to do next year, is purchase all that material ourselves. The groundskeepers are going to do that work. So that's why we're seeing an increase in the supplies, but contractual services within that same um, subcategory of categories, the 1621 codes, is going to go down. Contractual services, I think, goes down about $80,000. Thank you. No, thank you for that. Thank you for providing that answer for that. Because I did, you know, just also part of my learning of this. I appreciate having that information. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see another one. Oh, another one that I wanted to just talk about was the materials, and I know that we are increasing that line by quite a bit, and I know that's to cover the possible changing of our mascot, which I, I just have to put it out there that. I can see that this increase is going up. It's going up to. Oh, I'm trying to see where it's going to. It's going up a lot. Oh, it's going up over a hundred percent. So, you know, which is a lot of money. I think it's showing that it's going to be over two hundred thousand dollars, and it just has to be put out there that yes, we did enter. You know, to to try to keep our mess up. We entered that lawsuit. We capped ourselves at twenty five thousand, which is considerably less than what the line is going up if we have to change it. Um, that's a that's a, a decent amount to raise that line. Is there any chance that we could trim that line? Because we are in you know in the process of trying to maintain our mascot and we kept ourselves at twenty five thousand to increase that budget, you know, two hundred thousand dollars, which is way more than the lawsuit at this point, is that an area that we can possibly trim? So we will absolutely take a close look at that. Um, obviously, we're, we're hopeful. Um, the Board of Education uh, made a decision. I strongly support and recommend it, that we fight to keep our mascot, uh, to keep the Thunderbird. Uh, you know, this is just a precaution, and the, and the hope is that none of that money has to be spent and that it returns as fund balance, much needed fund balance to replenish. Um, but we will take a close look to see if we can you know, reduce that a little bit um, and still and still have some uh, uh, money for potential needs. Why can't we move that back and have um, and have that be in the event of, of this? Because we don't know if this could be two years down the road. We don't know. We keep talking about taking money from our reserves. That should be what we take from the reserves down the road in the event that we had to. And that shouldn't be something we should be budgeting for this year 
not knowing if it's even going to happen. And that's a, and that's accessing a, people. And that's, a, and that's a fair point. We did increase the use of reserves dollar for dollar to cover that. And that's why the hope is we don't spend any of it and it all comes back. But if we did have to spend, it would be a one-time expense where you have to tap into the reserve. So we did do dollar for dollar to uh, increase the use of reserve to cover that. But we could certainly look at that figure. I think it, when you it gets close to what, 270 to 300,000, I think we could take a, a closer look and bring that and bring that down. I don't want to give a dollar amount, but let's we'll revisit that uh, over the coming days. Especially since also Senator White is fighting for money for that as well, um, is my understanding, and fighting in the event she's advocating through the state and with other government officials that if we had to change the mascot, and it should not be on the backs of our taxpayers or us, it should be on the backs of the actual state that wants this to be done. Now, that's another great point. In fact, um, yes, the Senator Wyke and, and our assembly people in the area uh, have all been supportive of us. In fact, Senator Wyke is in the process, uh, I don't think a bill number has been assigned, but uh, submitting a bill that would exempt Kennequat uh, from uh, the mascot mandate. So certainly, Senator Wyke, all of our uh, representatives in the state assembly, besides advocating for our state aid they've also been very good advocates on behalf of our mascot situation as well we will absolutely revisit the amount of funding that we're looking to allocate for any kind of mascot related expenses um and uh and we'll uh, see what kind of adjustment we can make in the coming days thank you yeah because i noticed too that in the answer that i received said that the guidance requires us to budget for it so that was another little part of my question i know that there's you know, been a little gray as far as guidance and requirements from the state. So are we, I'm going back to a meeting once before when um, Doug had said some things that we must or should or may. Do we really have to budget, you know, for this? So let's assume we weren't in litigation. Um, we, we have to budget. So the guidance is while you're in litigation, budget just in case. So we'll revisit the amount and see if we still feel that if, if it doesn't work in our favor and whatever it kicks in, that we have uh, some funding available to start that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I just have one, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the line that's um, BOSI computer assessed instruction um, for the 2.1 million, can you explain what that is? It's a 2630. If you need the number, I can give it to you. Would you just give that number, April, please? Yeah, it starts 2630, and then it's 49031, and then four zeros. So this this appears to represent a compilation of different uh, products, including smart boards, including software, um, and I, I believe that the number isn't directly related to any one particular item. Um, it's there. It seems like there are purchases through BOCES that fall under this particular category. So, for instance, the um, our point of sale for food service called Mosaic is included within this code. Smart board purchases are included within this code. I can get more detail for the Board of Education regarding what other computer items or computer-related software is covered within this code as well. If you could, and also, um, do we lease these or do we pay them on a yearly basis or when we buy, do we just buy? The smart boards? Smart boards and the mosaic, like is that a monthly fee, yearly fee? How is that software, you know, you buy software, so you can buy it over three, five, yeah, one? Annu annually. 
so their, their annual software costs. The, our smart board hardware is owned by the district, right? So the device that you're looking at on the stage is something that's owned by the district. That, that's not leased. Um, and the, the component features of the software that goes into our smart boards are annual, annual costs to the district. Okay, so if you could give me more information, I'd appreciate sure. it. Sure, I'll get you a list of, of the different applications that are included under here. I appreciate that. Right. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Hauser. You're welcome. Okay. Moving on to our superintendent's update, Dr. Sinmore. Thank you, Ms. Mallard. Well, Mother Nature over the last few weeks has certainly been very busy, and we, uh, we do appreciate the support and cooperation uh, between our staff, families, students, and community. Um, I want to give a shout out to our ENL department for a wonderful ENL night at RMS last month. The uh, large turnout of families, students, and staff uh, at the end of March. Our varsity softball uh, team had a very special event, Strikeout Suicide. Um, they brought in uh, outside partner care provider agencies. It, it really was a critical reminder of how we all need to band together to provide support uh, for those in crisis. So certainly kudos to the coaching staff um, and, and, and the players as well. Last week, uh, we had a Wear Blue Day in honor of Officer Diller, law enforcement, and all first responders, and that was truly a heartwarming event. We appreciate uh, the, the uh, participation of our, our staff and students. And all these type of events are a constant reminder of how this community will so often rally together. It really is a hallmark of Connect Watch Schools. Last Friday was a big night for the PTA with a really cool Idle Hour talent show that was over, uh, over here at OBMS. Uh, kids, kids, staff, including the principal, all had their talents on full display. Um, and there was also a highly successful pound auction at the high school on Friday where there was a little less talent on display. But we, we thank the PTAs for all of uh, their, their, their great effort. And getting back to Idle Hour, it was, it, any time that the staff get, get engaged in an activity, you know, we've seen that throughout the year at all levels, uh, it, it sends an extra special message to, to kids and, uh, and to their families. So kudos to, to everybody, kudos to our, our PTA. Uh, tomorrow, schools are closed uh, for Eid and the celebration of the end of Ramadan, wishing our families who are observing a happy holiday. This Friday, we have the Showcase of the Arts starting at 5.30 as well as at, um, 5.30 at the high school, as well as a Nisma Festival later on April 18th, also at the high school. On Monday, April 15th, is Disabilities Awareness Fair and Unified Basketball Game. March was Disabilities Awareness Month. This does extend into April with Autism Awareness. April 2nd was Autism Awareness Day. We want to thank SEPTA for all of their coordination with all these great events. And as always, we thank PTA, SEPTA, ORBA, who are our music and art boosters, the athletic boosters, and all of our civics for all that they do for our students and community. Also on April 15th, later that night, we have uh, the Seal of Biliteracy Ceremony at the high school. 117 seniors. Let me, let me repeat that. 117 seniors, a couple of them receiving multiple world language recognitions, are being recognized. This is an amazing accomplishment for our students to have this language credential on their graduation. Congratulations to our incredible students and our amazing world language department. And then later on, on April 17th, we have a wonderful library literacy celebration at the high school. A lot of great stuff happening in Connect Club. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Board of Ed topics. We have the Wear Blue event, Ms. DiLorenzo. Thank you. Uh, before I start that, I do want to just say that the pound auction was, was fantastic, and I, I want to give a lot of credit to the PTA who did it, the students that helped out, and our very own auctioneer who did a phenomenal job Thank you, Dr. C. It really was fantastic. Thank you for, for doing that event. It was, it was really wonderful. So great job to everyone. Um, but yeah, the, the Wear Blue event, I, I want to thank Dr. C and I want to thank our community for, for taking this on because it is really, really important. We have a lot of blue families, first responder families, and it's at home. So I, I think it was really beautiful for us to 
recognize that and to honor them and in this special way by by wearing blue and offering you know to, and putting that out there to our school so I, I want to th thank you I'm, I'm very proud to be part of this community and to be even in this role to be able to fully support that in this role as a trustee I and I, I, so thank you for doing that and personally I'm I'm not a blue family but I have complete full respect they put their life on the line and we see sort of the exact meaning of that with Officer Diller, and, and I, I, I thank you so much for that. It was really, really special. I appreciate that. I also want to piggyback on that. Well, first, I just want to say that Idle Hour did an amazing job. I wasn't able to be there, but I did get video sent to me. Thank you very much from the PTA and some of the, the parents there were very sweet. They knew I wanted to see it, so they sent me videos, and it was amazing. The milkshake shake, it was just I, I, I want to tell you, I was like, wow, it was, it was beautiful that you guys get involved and you do so much for the kids and really it brings such smiles to them. And then also seeing the kids, it was just amazing. I'm so sorry I missed it, but I had already um, committed to going to the Pound Auction. Uh, they did a great job at the high school fundraiser and uh, they did an amazing job. Everybody who took, who took um, time out of their night and uh, and also gave to the good, to the cause. It was it was a really nice night. Thank you, Dr. C, for making it so much fun. Um, moving on to the the uh, Detective Diller. It was I have to say that I want to thank Dr. Centimore because when a parent, well, more than one parent, but a few parents reached out, uh, we reached out to Dr. C, and Dr. C immediately was like, no problem, done. We're doing this. We're gonna we. And, and I got to tell you, that's what it was about. It wasn't something that, like, I had seen people saying to me, oh, is it political, is it this? Is No, it's, it's, we are stepping up to support a family in need from Massapequa, the same way we have stepped up for other families, regardless what they do for a living. What I will say, though, that I was upset about is that, while Jackie, thank you very much for participating as a board member and wearing blue that night, and that day, um, I was told that from many parents that our board president did not participate and was at the school for the curriculum committee. And on top of that, the night that we had a board meeting just days after the incident, I expected it is the board president's position to set the agenda. This is not the first time. This is not the second time. This is, though, many mistakes being made in regards to setting the agenda. How we don't say at, that we don't give a moment of silence, we're doing it for servicemen and women. I understand you might not want to pick a side, you're somebody who likes to sit on the fence to get it, but you can't do that with things like this. The right thing to do would have been for the board president or whoever was saying the Pledge of Allegiance to do a moment of silence for Detective Diller and his family. Afterwards, I did speak at the last meeting. Um, afterwards, kind of to fix the mistake that was made earlier. But it was a mistake, and it should not continue to keep happening. We, we, I thank you, Dr. C, for showing your support. Everyone should be able to do that who chooses to. And if you choose not to, own it. I, I will 100% take ownership for that misstep. It was 100%. I should have said something it I did not it, not that I don't value our service men in blue I I just it was it was a fault on my side and I do apologize I do not own a lot of blue clothing just I just don't I have a lot of black I try to look a little slimmer for a bigger girl that I am but I I, I have no there's nothing I can say for not wearing blue but I, I, it is, I will take responsibility for not, ex, not acknowledging Officer Diller that night. Okay, moving on. Board of Ed information, Ms. napolitano Ferno. So I like to, I went to, I hate, I hate that I always have to be the bearer of bad news and the Debbie Downer, but it just is what it's going to be. I went to Idle Hour where I had to, and this should never happen again uh, with any board member, 
I had to feel uncomfortable that we had a board member questioning a teacher in a setting that was inappropriate. At the time, I did tell the board member it was inappropriate. Um, I did tell Miss Poppy it was in a, and she was not involved in it. She was just there. Thankfully, I was able to say to her, "I feel uncomfortable. This is inappropriate." As board members, when we come to the school to see a program, we ask you questions about the program. We are not there to ask you questions about should people be accessed? Should this be a? Should this be? You know, is this a program that you know we could access right now? That is not for you to have to answer, and my apologies for anyone who had felt they had to. It was wrong, it should not have been done. And to be very honest, I said this to Dr. Centimore, I said it to Mrs. Poppy, had that been me who said that, we would have gotten ripped by more emails from the CTA president than any board member in human history. So that's, that's not even me saying that facetiously. That is 100% the truth. He would have 100% sent emails on how wrong it was that I put myself in that position and put there his teacher in that position. It was wrong, and I hope in the future board members think twice before they put any board member in that position or teacher. It's inappropriate, and it should not be done. We're there to, to ask questions about a program, not to get them to decide how to cut our budget. It isn't their job to do that. That's our job, and we have to own it. Thank you. Um, Ms. Anatelli, you have dance program and interventionist. Um, yeah, so I already spoke about both programs, but I would like to say that um, if the teacher did not reach out to me, who was the interventionist, I never would have known to come and see the program. So I want to thank her for reaching out to me and asking me to come to see the program to see how amazing it was. And I'd like to put out there for anyone, doesn't matter if you're a staff, a student, anyone, that if you have something that you want the board to see or, you know, you think it's important, please let us know. Because it, it was, you know, the one touch that made the difference in, in letting me understand that program. Something I didn't know before. Thank you. Lunch program, Ms. Sainatelli. So uh, I'm going to say a few things and then I'll hand it over to Mr. Hauser. Um, <laughs> first, I'd like to also thank the community, too. Because, you know what, if people don't bring the positives and their concerns to the board, we, we might not know that there, these things are happening. So anybody who reaches out, I, I do want to thank you. And um, you know, most of the time, if you want to be anonymous, it's anonymous. So I, I'd like to keep that there too, that you know, we, we do appreciate it. This week, I did get several complaints about the lunch program. Many, you know, through the years, as, as it's been said many times on this board, we speak about this lunch program very often. Uh, we've been getting complaints about the lunch program for years, and it doesn't matter if it's the current company we had, the, the you know, prior company or not. But we constantly have um, complaints. You know, the food isn't good, there's not enough food, that, you know, so many things. So what I'm suggesting is that um, we have a lot of committees here at Connect that we should have a lunch program committee that could meet once a month, just like the curriculum committee committee and you know that we could have staff um, board member uh, community members and if there are challenges or if somebody maybe has a, a positive thing to say it gives everybody the opportunity to hopefully work on this because if we communicate about it instead of just constantly you know complaining and you know we're part of the complaints because we come up here and we complain and we say what's going on and then we think it's resolved and then parents you know and students complain again so I, I really would appreciate it if we could do some kind of committee, again, once a month, once every other month, something just so that, um, you know, first of all, I, I don't think anybody's to blame here either. You know, circumstances happen and, you know, some kids believe we do, it is good. Some say we, we, it isn't good. Again, complaints, you know, throughout the years, no matter which um, company we went with. So I would like to put on the table about the committee and maybe getting together as a community to, to help make this program better. For the long run. The second thing I would like to say is that um, as many of you know, uh, when we um, accepted and approved the contract for Airmark that we have now, we uh, gave them a one-year contract. Uh, we said that, you know, we gave them a one-year contract because we wanted to try them out and, you know, see how it went. It has been decided 
uh, that we are not going to do another RFP this year and that we are going to extend the contract. So with that said, I wanted, I felt the public should know this due to the fact that what we said in the beginning of this school year was that we would only do it for a year, evaluate and put out again. So I wanted to let everybody know that that wasn't happening. And there's several reasons why, um, not myself, I, I do have to say that I, I actually did not support that we were um, extending the contract. I didn't, again, it didn't matter to me if it was Airmark or another company, I just felt that since we said we were gonna do something, we should. But, you know, that as many of you know, we have a new breakfast program and uh, the free lunch and free breakfast, and they felt it was better off just going with the company that we have so that we could um, build upon what is going on now due to the fact that so many changes have come in place. Uh, so that's just uh, informational. But um, with that said, the complaints, you know, I did speak to Mr. Hauser and I will let him speak on um, the information he found out about the complaints. Thank you. So um, I, I think everyone is well aware that the, the food service workers, uh, the cook managers, that we employ in the district take great pride in their work. Um, today, uh, I had a meeting with the four cook managers as well as uh, Ms. Lella, the director of food service, and um, they, they are each aware of um, the, the recent complaints that we had. Um, we discussed them. We, we did the best we could with, with the information that we had as to the, the, the school building that the complaints were, uh, were about. Um, Sometimes these um, complaints are, are difficult to address because we don't have specifics. You know, we, we had a, a complaint that the taco bar uh, has not been open for quite a long period of time. But when I brought that up to the cook managers and to the director of food service, um, that doesn't seem to be substantiated. It, it is open. Um, it's not open third period um, when there's a transition time from breakfast over to lunch. Um, the other uh, complaint was the uncooked uh, meatballs. Um, when we actually get those meatballs from the vendor, they are uh, pre-cooked. They're frozen, but they're pre-cooked. So, um, you know, we go through another step here to actually, uh, I'll say, warm up or heat the meatballs uh, before they're served. But it's, um, it's it was difficult for us to understand when someone said. Um, the meatballs were, were undercooked or not cooked, you know, especially when they come from the vendor um, the way they do. The other comment was, uh, I think, soggy chicken cutlet um, item. Um, once again, you know, that item um, comes to us from a vendor. We actually uh, prepare that item in an air fryer for 20 minutes. So it was difficult for the cook managers and the director of food service to understand how that particular complaint could come about when each time that item is served, that day, um, the item is actually prepared. It doesn't lay around. It's not cooked the, the day before. So we, we do take these concerns very seriously. Um, we discuss them, we speak about them, we try to get as much information as possible, and we try to improve the program as best we can uh, with that information. But, um, but I just want everyone to know that, you know that the food service staff does take a lot of pride and concern in, in their work uh, that they do for the district. Thanks, Bob. Um, I definitely agree with you, and I know they do. Uh, one of the other concerns was that there wasn't enough food. So they were running out of food. I don't know. If, I don't know if you got an answer on that. And I believe it was um, fourth, seventh. Uh, <laughs> you know, they gave specific um, periods. It was the yeah, high school. Yes, I, I had heard school, too, but I, but I heard it was to know at if you the got high an school. Answer on that one. Yeah, you know, from time to time and throughout this school year, we we've heard this, and and at times it is factual that, that they have run out of uh, food. Um, sometimes it's based on demand. You know, I'll say unanticipated demand. Other times, it's based on uh, deliveries not coming uh, on time when we anticipated that they would be here. Um, we we are working as best we can to try to gauge um, the placement of the orders. 
the, that the cook managers place each week, especially for the uh, the elementary schools where we don't or do not have a cook manager. Um, it's a little more challenging right now with the volume of meals, especially since breakfast is free. Uh, is it's new to, to a lot of the school buildings, but it's free, and also lunch now, you know, being free to everyone. So, um, you know, we are doing the best we can to, to monitor. I, I don't think there's any thing intentional being done to uh, to not have enough food available for the students each day. Yeah, I, I don't think it's intentional either, but what the parents were saying is that um, they don't want the students to suffer just because there's short staffing or, like you said, that, you know, food's not coming in, deliveries aren't happening, and that even though they can understand that, they just don't want the students to lose out. So um, are you... Uh, Amicable about having a meeting or? Um... I think that's a great idea. I really do. You know, just as a comparison, you mentioned other committees in the district. I, I know uh, about three years ago when I first came here, we were, we were getting some uh, concerns for transportation. And we decided to put together a, uh, a special transportation committee that would meet to discuss our concerns. And I think most people would agree it was, it was a, a big success, you know, and it really uh, gave uh, parents, the community, even uh, bus drivers or, or um, assistants on the bus or anyone, any employee of the district uh, an opportunity, if they wanted to, to come forth and, uh, and let us know. So I, I feel that food service can be uh, another um, venue to, if we have a committee like that to bring some of these concerns, if not all of these concerns, and, and address them. I think that would be a great idea. I, I fully support the idea of a lunch program committee. And I, and I can start that. I can get that. If it's, you know, something we want to do, but that's easy enough to get off the ground. I have one more thing I'm going to work on. So it actually goes back to Board of Ed information. So I've been saying for years, and prior boards have agreed with me, that we should have nights where it's a special night for the kids, not just every board meeting have four or five kids, have a handful of kids. Have the, It would be so nice to have a special night, the same way we have special nights for tenure where there's cake and there's coffee and there's cookies for the kids. It's a nice thing, and that's what our district should be doing. We did it about three years ago when it was a different board, and it was very, very nice. It was having a special night for the kids. I'm not saying do it just once because there's a lot of kids getting achievements, but we could easily have one night for, you know, sports, one night for, you know, academics, one night for, you know, teachers with the heroics. And all. my whole point is, it is, I feel for the kids that the audience, that there's not an audience like tonight, there was a big enough audience because there was a lot of kids, which is nice. But there are some nights where there's no audience and the kids don't get anything special. Now, I've been saying this for years. I've said it for the last two years. It doesn't seem like anyone listens. But what I will say is April sent an email about the Skills USA. Thank you very much. I supported it. And, uh, and so did Jackie. And Marisol answered. And it was for BOCES for the Skills USA competition, which will be giving them their awards in the next in the next or following board meeting. But what's very sad is that board president sets agenda. That is how it is. You set the agenda. You answered it. I would certainly support this. But then had a then had an agenda set without it being on there. I understand that things happen, people make mistakes. I understand. I got the email, you've been busy, you get it, understood. But I was disgusted that over the weekend, I got April writing rudely to admin. You, yeah, it was rude. It was 100% rude. It's a and, matter of opinion. Oh, okay, it's a matter of opinion. Jackie, was it rude? There's a way to state your opinion and be completely respectful, and I, I, your emails were not respectful. I can agree to disagree. So why don't you read it? I don't need to. Well, read it. Give, give you transparency. It's absolutely 
No, it does. When you are working, it has nothing to do with kids. No, it does. Nothing to do with kids. The children, when not everything that you brought up in the past five times you spoke, has nothing to do with children. What's the problem? Do you not like transparency? No, I love transparency. What I don't like is you guys don't like transparency. What are you talking about? Send me email. Why do you guys hide everything in email? And it's not finished. Okay, Kaylin, why is that? What is the problem with telling the children? In the email, April expressed her disappointment in the fact that the children were not, no, although children, they are still missing some names of the children. That is what happens. Okay, when somebody states, I really feel we can we keep on, to why don't you, well, guess what, this foil and how much we've spent on foils. speak in public. She doesn't, this is, we all answered. They're sending emails at a public. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. She doesn't understand that, Yes. Okay, that's fine. But what I'm saying to you is, she, right, she doesn't understand. She doesn't understand. Well, why don't you read it out loud then, April? Like I read things and tell the I'm truth. okay with moving on. And this I'm isn't, sure this isn't involved. April's board discussion. I wish I could walk out with you guys. I, I would just be like, safe. it's very simple. I would just like students to not be forgotten because you set the agenda and you forgot about them and stated it was a mistake. So, in the future, why don't you look into having a big night so that you don't forget any students, not that we selectively choose which students are going to have it tonight, which students tomorrow night, which, and have a night where there's an audience for the kids at the high school where we have a nice night, we have cookies, we have cake like we do for the tenure. It's a nice thing, and that's what we should be doing. Not, here's your, here's your hat, here's your, here's your certificate, and what's the hat, what's the hurry? Like, I just don't understand. It seems more like a campaigning strategy than doing what's right for the kids. Thank you. I appreciate your opinion. Does anyone else have anything that they would like to add? Okay. Um, can I call for a motion and a second to approve the financial matters items two through seven? Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Can I call for a motion and a second to approve the instructional and non-instructional personnel items as presented? Second. All in favor? Were the two positions removed? Yes, they were removed. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Does anybody have any questions on the consent agenda before I read? Yes, but I was wondering if the public had any questions on the consent agenda. Okay, so Ms. Ianatelli, you want to remove item number three from the consent agenda? Correct. Uh, item number three of the consent agenda is the superintendent hearing appeal. Can I call for a motion and a second to approve items 2 and 4 through 19? Motion. Can I get a second? Does anybody have any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Can I call for a motion and a second to approve item number three, superintendent hearing appeal? I'm going to do a roll call vote. Mr. Murphy? I'm a yes. Um, Mr. Palatano Ferno? I'm a yes. Ms. DiLorenzo? Yes. 
Miss Ainatelli. Yeah, I just like to make it clear. A yes means you deny it. A yes is to, you deny it. So I'm a no. Okay. All right. I will now open the floor for the open public comment portion of the agenda. I will call individuals forward one at a time. Please wait for my acknowledgement before stepping to the podium. You should have received the number card from security on your way in. If you have not, please see a security guard in the back of the room. Any person wishing to address the board shall address the board president only. Comments should be kept as brief as possible and relate to school matters only. Each person is limited to three minutes for one or more topics. Individual employees, parents, or children should not be identified by name, title, position, grade, or building. The use of foul language and threatening comments will not be tolerated, and the board will consider a recess until order is restored. In accordance with policy 1230, public comment will not exceed 30 minutes. If there are additional persons wishing to speak, the board may consider a motion to extend the time. Person number one. Number one. Number two. Our apologies, Mr. Berger. Microphone on. Okay, can we give respect to the respect to the community members up speaking? Guys. Mr. Burgers, proceed. Good. Okay, thank you. Uh, question about the savings through attrition. Uh, to my knowledge, connect block runs at twenty to twenty five percent under capacity on our contractually required maximum class sizes. As far as the special education teacher reduction of three, uh, Ms. Poppy answered this question probably about an hour, hour and a half ago. Um, and very technically, I, I understand that classes won't exceed their 813, 811, 1211, 1511, but they currently are nowhere near those numbers. With these savings through attrition, can we expect them to be at those numbers, or do we have a decrease in enrollment in special education? And uh, I don't think that was a campaign question. Is, is that your only question? I'm just going to let you finish your time. And then no, we'll... that was my only question. Okay, I'm I was just going to let you finish, and then we'll roll back to no, you. Thank answers. you, guys. Special okay. ed decreasing, or special ed class size is going to increase to their closer to their maximum? Great question. It depends on the programmatic needs of the incoming class, right? So you're correct. I know you know that you're correct in that we can approach in certain classes particular thresholds for student enrollment. And typically, in this district, we don't reach those thresholds, typically. Every year, programmatically, the enrollment in particular courses is driven by student need. We also have student need in areas that are less in the spotlight in terms of those thresholds. Right? So I'm, I'm thinking about resource needs, right? which require special educators, right? which don't have widely publicized ratios, like the ones that I think we're referring to are small mm -hmm. classes, or self-contained classes, or ICT classes. So depending upon student need, you may see increases that are closer to those thresholds or not based upon grade level, based upon who is enrolling in which program on which campus, right? So I can't make a blanket, yes, we're going to see increases all the way through in all of our programmatic settings in special education. Could there be increases in some areas? Yes, they would not be exceeding the thresholds for those courses. And I don't believe that we would be seeing increases that are, I'm, I'm going to say blanketly, startlingly 
uh, more than what we typically experience, right? So those, those uh, that attempt at attrition with those three individuals is really based upon programmatically where students are situated enrollment-wise for next year, but not placing us in a situation where, and it, maybe this will help clarify, should programmatic needs change next year, we won't be faced with a situation where we would be going over uh, certain levels and certain course, uh, certain types of courses for student enrollment. We, we may be getting closer to the level, but not exceeding the level for those particular courses. Okay, I, I understand it's, the profiles are still being made for next year. When these three positions were determined not to be uh, rehired or replaced, mm -hmm. Is it anticipated that a classroom, let's say a 12 one one that only has nine right now, may have 10 or 11? Like, has that been looked at? Do you know it, the answer to that? It could. Okay. Again, it depends, upon, it depends upon student enrollment and the student need on that particular campus in that particular setting. Okay. Thank you. Right. It's tough to give a blanket response to questions like that because we're so individualized case by case. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berger. And honestly, my apologies. Mr. Murphy owes you an apology because you have absolutely nothing to do with what's going on up here tonight. And that was totally uncalled for. Thank you for your question sure. and, and appreciate just in response the special to that. education. Okay. Thank you. Can I? Yes, you can. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Thank you, Mr. Berger, and good luck in your campaign. But, Jackie? Don't go on Facebook and post that you have a good relationship with every board member when I've never had a conversation with you. So that is... Brian, does this have anything to do with children? Number three. I think there's a lot of people... No, I, guys, I, we're moving, we're moving on to number, people number three. on Facebook stories that are ridiculous. Like, how much did the investigation if, cost, Brian? Can go back Was it $600,000? Mr. Mr. Napolitano, Maybe Ms. guys, Mallon, can we give, can we give consideration to the person at the podium? Since Ms. Mallon doesn't do that often. Truth and transparency is not something you two really like. I love the words truth and transparency. And guess what? I live by them, and I'm more transparent than any of you. That's for sure. Hello. Hi. Um, I've uh, got the calendar from uh, Bay Point, Blue Point. I want someone to take it so that I see that a lot of this is done by the Chamber of Commerce, and I see that it is mailed out. This has got to cost a ton of money. I don't know if it's the Chamber of Commerce who's funding the whole thing or a piece of this or what piece of this, but uh, we, we should find out only to figure out what, the, what this thing actually costs because in this, in this year, I don't think we can afford uh, printing any kind of calendar. Um, at a meeting last night at the uh, Oakdale Civic Association, we're talking about how badly... Um, it's going to hurt if we don't get this million dollars. So um, I had an email today from the New York State PTA. I have a link here that maybe someone wants to publish. Maybe we can get four or 5,000 people to just take four minutes and write an email to um, Governor Hochul. Third thing is um, the, uh, there's going to do some, they're going to do some building at the old uh, site over in uh, Locust Avenue. And um, they're going to put up 40 uh, apartments, and they're going, they are expecting 4.6 children in those apartments. And uh, not that that's a big number, but they are not going to pay any taxes, or they're going to pay a very, very reduced amount of uh, taxes from the first year to maybe the 10th or the 20th year. Um, and it's nice that they're going to spend like $7.5 million and we're not going to get anything. Uh, everyone here who owns a home, when you moved in and you got your C of O and you got your title or whatever, um, you started paying taxes immediately the next day. You didn't get a 10-year or a 20-year abatement. And I think what we need to do as a school district, as a board, as an administration is we need to get ourselves on the calendars for the town of Islip every time they're going to approve or they're going to have a meeting, a board meeting, for some sort of new construction. And we should fight all these pilots, they call them, payments in lieu of taxes. Because the person who's going to take the hit are going to be us. 
all of us homeowners. All these apartment dwellers are not going to pay taxes, not, not school taxes. And yet there's going to be some number of children that come to our schools and the rest of us are going to have to pay that bill. And if the state's not going to help us, uh, we certainly need to help ourselves. So that's what I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Can you leave the calendar up there and we'll, we'll grab it? I appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Number four. I have a question for Mr. Hauser. On uh, the budget account 1420, for the legal uh, services, and uh, I guess the first question is, uh, do all legal matters pass through that budget? Everything's accounted for in that in those four line items. So I'm going to let you finish your questions, and then we'll circle back and answer them if that's okay. 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 Uh, so continuing on, um, there are. Four Four line items, arbitration, negotiations, retainer, and additional services. Uh, over the last two years, they, uh, they've been going up dramatically. Um, the total uh, fee for legal services has gone up 21% in two years. The additional legal services have gone up 25% in two years. Uh, the additional legal services make up 72% of the entire legal budget. It's almost a half million dollars. So uh, the question I have on the additional legal services is, uh, it's kind of a, a bland line item. Uh, what goes into that? Uh, does a Thunderbird issue go into that? Um, does a pride flag go into that? Does some of the more mundane things go into that? It's trying to get an understanding of how the budget is being impacted with the way the district is being run right now. Okay, so you're correct. The legal is broken out into four separate line items. And as you highlighted, uh, arbitration, negotiations, uh, the legal retainer line, and then the uh, legal additional services. Um, Perhaps I'll answer your questions as, as you most recently asked and work my way back. That's fine. Um, so that legal, additional uh, legal services, that would be um, all legal bills that are, I'll say, not covered by just the blanket uh, retainer agreement that we have. Uh, In other words, our... Mr. Spencer, all of his time. Correct. Is... Now, if he does a work away from the board meetings, that's part of his retainer? No, that would be over and above. So over that would go above. into that additional. So if he does something specifically additional, that's additional legal service. Correct. Okay. Right. And not just that firm. It could be other law firms as well. Right. Um, I'm sorry. What, and what was the first part of your, your question? Well, it was, does, does the 1420 account uh, cover all legal matters? I would say so. Yes, I, I can't think of anything else that would not go through through those accounts. Unless the only thing is, if our insurance company, um, if if our policy picked up the coverage of a particular legal matter, mm -hmm. then then the insurance company would bear the the cost of that legal fee. So and you get a credit back to the account. Uh, uh, not really. It would just be covered by the the, the, the insurance okay. company. Yep. Okay. Mr. Hauser, I think some of the um, specifics that this gentleman brought up um, that we don't want to get into the weeds in terms of litigation, but no, some, but if, some if of the matters are, are going on. And if it's a half million dollars being spent on them, I think that's important for the district to know. Understood, sir. In yeah. terms of um, when an insurance carrier would pick up the, the legal expense with some of these situations... I don't know what detail we could give at this, you know, at this time on that. 
I'm more the interested litigations. in the big items, you know, something that's meaning, meaningful to what the discussions were tonight. Yeah, and, and typically the flag, the mascot, you know, you the, 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 the first flag. course of, of action would be to, yeah, the, the first course of action would be to notify our insurance company of, of a legal matter or a legal claim, not just uh, assume that it's the district's responsibility. Mm -hmm. So once we hear back from the insurance company, we would know whether they're covering it or whether we have to go right. through uh, other counsel. Right. So the discussions tonight on, on the Thunderbird, those discussions, I think I heard 25,000, that would be embedded in the additional legal services? Correct. Okay. Okay. So it, it goes down to small line items, too? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Sorry, one second. Yeah, okay. we're trying to give you as much detail. Um, so with regards to some of the, uh, this litigation, uh, NICER is covering the vast majority of it. That's our insurance uh, carrier. Okay, now there, that's there, it could that's be a, a, a situation where we may need to get additional legal guidance through, you know, through, let's say, Gersio and Gersio, and that could incur an expense that the insurance carrier would. Okay. You know, one of the things might be useful to the community, especially on nights like tonight where you're talking about making hard decisions. I mean, we have seen over the last two years a lot of ugliness that we've gone through, especially in school board meetings, okay? Uh, so we are aware of the ugly side of life. We're not aware of any of the things that you just discussed right now, which would mitigate the cost to the community over paying for both sides of these fights. So if there's stuff coming back that helps the community pay on a budget line item, you know, it would be interesting, actually very useful, I think, to give feedback and an update to the community. And I understand Mr. Spencer would not want to have details about the litigation, but there's financial details which are well, he can, you know, can well be addressed to give an understanding to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Number five. Good evening. Uh, my name is Greg Bumbrook. I am the operational unit president. Um, I was a graduate of Connecticut in 92. I am going on 26 years of service currently as the chief custodian of this building, Oakdale Bohemian Middle School. Um, normally, I don't speak. We're kind of behind the scenes. Um, operationally, is the grounds department, maintenance, food service, custodial, um, basically everything that makes the buildings run, we do it. Um, I was going to talk weeks ago about food service. Um, fortunately, the district has sat back down with us, and we've worked out a lot of our differences, and we're moving forward in a positive light. Although it's been rocky, it's you know a new program, and everybody has been a real trooper. Um, all our, all our kitchen people are fantastic, show a lot of pride. I am amazed at how much goes into that job for as little as they get paid. And I know that's a negotiated thing, but it's a, um, it's, it's a thankless job, and they do it great. So I'm very proud of all of them. Um, I'm, I want to talk about the attrition of the operations. So we have um, a maintenance guy retiring. And although we talk about attrition and we talk about, um, you know, it's just a guy retiring. Well, if we don't replace that job this year and we say, oh, we're going to put it off the next year, and then next year comes and we say, well, we can take away from this position instead and fill that position, it doesn't work. You, all your buildings are over 50 years old. Although we're putting new systems in, that's terrific. The building itself, your structure, your, your bones, needs care. It needs knowledge. It needs more than we already have, and now you're going to take away. I think it's detrimental to the district, and it's, it's bad for our unit, but it's worse for you guys. The knowledge we're losing with this retiree is a tremendous loss in, uh, in, in its own. But to not even try to fill or have somebody learn what that person is now voided, you're going to spend more over time 
outsourcing those, those jobs to contractors that are going to, they charge you four to five times more than we get paid. We save you exponentially. Recently, we have taken over most of the repairs on refrigeration because we have such a great, knowledgeable um, maintenance crew. They, they pour themselves into the job. They know the stuff. They save the money. We're now taking on more in the grounds department. So if we can save you money, how do you even look at anybody and say, oh, we're going to cut that job. That saves money. It doesn't make sense. You need to go back and look at the whole picture. And that's all I have to say. I appreciate your time. Thank you, and thank you for expressing that. And I appreciate all the work everybody does. As a few of us said today, we are not for losing that position at all, so we will try to make sure. It I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that insight from your perspective, or your, your, your experience perspective, because I do, I do agree with that. So thank you so much for that. Thank yes, thank you. Number six. Okay. Can I please have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting? Motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Have a good night.